the characteristic behavior of a fluid is dependent on the Reynolds number of the flow. A fluid flow stays laminar between the Reynolds numbers of 1000 and a million. This range, however, is just a guideline and the exact range depends on various factors such as the free stream conditions, surface roughness and others. One question you might have is, what happens to the flow beyond this range? The short answer is that it transitions to a turbulent flow. Let us now spend some time understanding what this means and what happens as we exceed the laminar flow range. A laminar flow is characterized by smooth organized motion of the fluid layers. However, as the Reynolds number of a laminar flow increases, the orderly nature is lost and a chaotic flow pattern referred to as the turbulent flow is established. The process through which a laminar flow becomes turbulent consists of multiple stages and is often referred to as transition or the onset of turbulence. For most industrial fluid flows, the Reynolds number at which transition occurs is relatively small, meaning that these flows are almost always turbulent. Osborne Reynolds demonstrated the laminar turbulent transition process through his famous experiment where he visualized the motion of water flow at different rates by introducing dyed water into it. At low flow rates, he noticed that the stream of the dyed water remained distinct throughout the length of the tube. However, as the flow rate is increased beyond a certain value, the dye diffused across the entire cross-section of the tube. In fact, it is through these experiments that he proposed a similarity criterion which we eventually name the Reynolds number. This Reynolds number relates the inertial and the viscous forces in a fluid flow. The phenomenon of transition is dependent on many factors such as the surface roughness, free stream turbulence level, and etc. Also, the type of transition is different based on the flow situation. For example, for boundary layer flows such as the flow over a solid surface, the primary instability mechanism is through the amplification of the tolman schlichting waves. These are the two-dimensional disturbances that travel in the mean flow direction which eventually get amplified and force the uniform boundary layer to transition to the three-dimensional turbulent boundary layer. Based on numerous theoretical and experimental studies, the location of transition for a flat plate boundary layer was predicted to be at an axial distance on the plate where the Reynolds number is around 350,000 to a million. For free shear layer flows where fluids are moving at different velocities relative to each other, the instability mechanism that describes the transition process is referred to as the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. This type of instability visually manifests in the form of vortical structures or ocean-like waves often seen in cloud patterns. The most famous example of the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability is the Jupiter's red spot. I know what you might be thinking. What causes transition? In order to understand that, we need to study the concept of stability. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever played with a hit me doll? No matter how hard you punch it, it always comes back up to the upright position. That is, it withstands disturbances 
and returns to the original undisturbed state. Such systems are considered to be stable systems. Let us consider the classical example of a ball in a bowl to demonstrate the different states of a system. If the bowl is right side up and the ball is set to roll, it oscillates for some time but eventually arrives at an equilibrium point. This is a stable system. This is similar to the hit me doll example. If we instead invert the bowl and place the ball on top of the bowl and give it a small push, the ball will roll away, all the while increasing its speed and will never come back to the original state. This is an unstable system. There can be other states such as neutrally stable, that is, say the ball is placed on a flat surface. If we now push the ball, it moves for a certain distance and remains stable at a different location. From a fluid dynamics point of view, for a fluid flow to be stable, it needs to be able to absorb and exhibit no noticeable changes when external disturbances such as flow property variations, surface roughness changes are encountered. In unstable fluid flows, any small disturbance to the flow results in visually noticeable flow changes, which eventually leads to the laminar turbulent transition. So, how do we predict the stability behavior of fluid flows? Well, today we can perform numerical simulations to identify the conditions at which the fluid flow transitions. However, a few hundred years ago, scientists did not have this luxury. In a few cases, they could do experiments. But for most situations, they had to resort to theoretical predictions. Most approaches used to predict stability of fluid flows fall under the category of small disturbance theory. In any typical small disturbance analysis, we have multiple steps. We first start off with the basic flow variable and disturb it using a small perturbation. This new variable is substituted into the governing equations of the particular fluid flow. From the new set of equations, we can obtain the governing equations for the evolution of the perturbation and these equations are generally referred to as the perturbation equations. These equations are then linearized to remove the higher order terms. The resultant equations after linearization should be homogeneous. These homogeneous equations are then solved and the eigenvalues are calculated, which are examined to determine the stability of the fluid flow. With this process in mind, let us implement it on predicting the instability character for free shear layer flows, that is, the kelvin helmholtz instability. Let us consider two flows of different velocities and densities separated by a horizontal interface. The flows are assumed to be potential, that is, irrotational, incompressible, and inviscid. For such flows, the velocity potential and the hydrostatic pressure distribution is given by the following equations. Since the flows are potential, they satisfy the Laplace equation. Following our established procedure for the small disturbance analysis, let us now impose a perturbation of the following form for both the velocity potential equations. We will impose that the disturbances are finite only at the interface and can be neglected far away from the interface. This assumption is basically our far field boundary condition. It is easy to show that the disturbances also satisfy the Laplace equation. Due to the perturbation 
the interface is also disturbed to the form shown here. There are two types of interface boundary conditions this system of equations need to satisfy, kinematic and dynamic. The kinematic condition at the interface requires that the vertical velocity of the two fluids match. Mathematically, this can be written as shown here. Since the fluid flows are assumed to be potential, the pressure in each of these fluids satisfies the unsteady Bernoulli's equation which is shown here. For the base undisturbed flow, this equation reduces to the form given here. The dynamic condition at the interface requires that the pressure is constant across the interface. Based on this, we can write the following relations at the interface between the two fluids before and after imposing the disturbance. If we assume that the perturbations are weak and only result in very small displacements of the interface, and if we can also ignore the higher order terms, the relations we obtain from the kinematic and the dynamic conditions can be recast in the form as shown here. We now have these three equations, the disturbance Laplace equation and the far field condition that the perturbations need to satisfy. Let us assume a simple two dimensional disturbance as shown here. Alpha is the real number and represents the wave number of the wave. Omega is a complex number and represents the frequency of the perturbation. The disturbance will be amplified and make the fluid interface unstable if the imaginary part of omega is positive, that is, greater than zero. If we substitute this perturbation in the Laplace equation and employ the far field boundary condition, we will obtain the amplitudes of perturbation as shown here. Using these amplitudes and the interface kinematic condition, we can extract the values of the unknown quantities. These relations are shown here. Substituting the perturbations into the dynamic condition and extracting the roots of the subsequent quadratic equation, we will obtain the eigenvalues of this system. The stability of the fluid system is dependent on the value of the highlighted term. The disturbance is unstable if the value is negative, neutral if the value is zero, and stable if the value is positive. Therefore, the unstable condition is given by the relation shown here. Till now, we discussed the prediction of instability for free shear layer flows. A similar methodology can be followed to characterize the stability for parallel viscous flows. These type of flows are common inside laminar boundary layers. Let us directly start with the perturbation form of the two-dimensional incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. If we assume that the disturbance is in the form of a wave traveling in the axial direction, the stream function of a single mode in the perturbation can be written in the following form. Here, omega is a complex number where the real part represents the frequency of the mode and the imaginary part is the amplification factor. If the imaginary part of omega is less than zero, the wave is damped and therefore the flow is stable. However, if this value is greater than zero, instabilities are present in the system that eventually get amplified. From the stream function, we can obtain the velocity components as shown here. If we substitute these velocity components into the disturbance equations 
and rearrange them such that the pressure term is eliminated, we obtain a fourth order differential equation for the amplitude function. This approach was independently developed by William Orr and Arnold Sommerfeld and this fourth order equation which describes the hydrodynamic stability characteristic of viscous parallel flows is referred to as the orr sommerfeld equation. This equation represents an eigenvalue flow problem with the following boundary conditions. The results obtained from solving the equation can be visualized in the form of curves that are referred to as the neutral stability curves or more commonly as the thumb curves. The region inside the thumb represents conditions where the disturbances are amplified. The lower limit of the Reynolds number at which the disturbances start amplifying is called the critical Reynolds number. For a Blasius boundary layer profile, the critical Reynolds number is about 91,000 based on the axial distance from the leading edge of the plate. The corresponding wave parameters from this Reynolds number are shown here. The smallest unstable wavelength is around 6 times the thickness of the boundary layer. This implies that the Tolmin Schlichting waves, which are the natural disturbances in the flow, are long compared to the boundary layer thickness. The maximum phase velocity of these Tolmin Schlichting waves is around 0.4, which indicates that these waves travel slowly and arise near the wall. Finally, the transition to turbulence occurs at around a Reynolds number of 3 million. This is around 30 times further downstream compared to the location of initial instability. The process of emergence of the Tolmin Schlichting waves and the eventual transition to turbulence for a flow over a smooth surface follows these basic steps. At the leading edge of the plate, there is a stable laminar flow until a location where the Reynolds number of the flow is below the critical Reynolds number. Beyond this point, two-dimensional Tolmin Schlichting waves emerge and start traveling downstream. These 2D waves quickly become unstable and take the shape of three-dimensional hairpin eddies. These vortices then break down, creating a cascade of turbulent eddies together forming the turbulent spots. These spots then combine to form a fully turbulent region, thereby completing the transition process. That brings us to the end of our discussion on the stability characteristics of laminar flows and the process of transition to a turbulent flow.